friends. <laughs> I just rode up on my friends and ran off. I was part of the circus. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Probably not too far with gas prices today. <laughs> Oh, and did you see on TV we're going to have another shortage of uh, toilet paper and paper towels and diapers and uh, Why? Cut. start cutting up my sheets? Why? Why? <laughs> because they can. Really, I'm not kidding you. They, they were showing them empty mm -hmm. things in one of those Costco's or some of those big stores. They were just loading down with paper towels and diapers and, mm -hmm. oh, and, like and laundry detergents. I'm going to go get some of that tomorrow. Laundry <laughs> detergent. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to start making live soap again. So y'all, some of y'all have to remember how. <laughs> <laughs> that's for my time, so one of you guys. Remember. I remember yeah. Mama had a big black kettle, and that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember that. <laughs> Do what? She used lime, lime. bacon grease. Uh, lime ashes. You can't buy lime ashes. Wood ashes. Yeah, can't buy a lot. We got a thing of lard, so if somebody has the lard. <laughs> 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 That's a black pot. We need a black pot. I've got a pot. I got plenty of ashes. So we got the pot. We just need the the lye, and we can make some lye soap. You can't buy lye anymore. So how come they use it? So y'all want me to like on Sunday uh, to wow. announce Ricky Treats condition yeah. and then uh, set aside a, a special collection for him on Sunday? Okay. Those addresses, okay. All that you can just keep that address okay. Okay. so you know where everybody is. Well, we can put our friend, a uh, friend in common, <laughs> Mary Fred Johnston, on the prayer list. What's his name? Mary Sorry. Fred, M A R I F R E D. That's a lady. Okay, That's her first name. <laughs> yes. I've never heard that. She's going to have surgery. They're doing bypass on her next week. Bypass surgery? Huh? You say gastric bypass surgery? No, I said just bypass just surgery. Bypass. Heart, oh. Just put heart surgery and that's okay. good enough. Okay. Who is she? <laughs> She's a friend of ours. She friend goes to church large. at uh, and, and then West End. Yeah. West Side. Yeah, she goes to West Side and we have played music together forever. A little background. Her youngest daughter had cancer really bad. Her oldest daughter and her went there and stayed with her through service. They removed half of her tongue, her cheeks, her, she had to learn how to talk all over again. Fill me in when I get something wrong, Jean. And they babied her through this and pulled her through and she's now talking and she's actually volunteered. She moved in with Mary Fred here and she's volunteering at the hospital. The older sister that drove and was their support then came down with cancer and died almost Oh, oh, I didn't know that. It was brain cancer. Oh, mm -hmm. it was just rapid. Hard to imagine Mary Fred with heart problems. She's so thin. She's been through all that pain. pain and all that stress. Yeah. And the last name is Johnston. J O H N S T O N. So you said Mary, Mary Fred Johnson? Mm hmm. Okay. Her mom's Johnson. name was Mary, her dad's name was Fred. Okay, Mary Fred. That's all one word. Johnson. Johnston, J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Well, no, <laughs> no I mean, right. it's, it's her name yeah. is spelled all the time as Johnson, and it, okay. <laughs> it, it'd be not. And the name of the preacher that passed away? No, it's his son. His it's, son. Yeah, it's... Micah, M-I-C-A-H, Sexon, S-E-X-S-O-N. We still X, a T in there? Um, it's, um. I always did just aggravating. Steve and <laughs> Gail Sexon are the parents. Steve was a preacher at Jerusalem, yeah, Arkansas. Jerusalem, Arkansas, okay. And Micah is the one who passed away. Ten years ago, mm -hmm. Steve okay. preached. They lived down at um, Texarkana. Not a stalking anybody else. 
Didn't he do something at Harding for a while? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was in the first of Eddie Clore and the yeah. whatever that thing is. And Eddie Rain. Okay. That's so bad for them. I'm so sorry. Sweet people. And Micah and Courtney have four kids. The oldest one, Daphne, graduates from high school oh. next month. My friend had already had two by uh, two two stints. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow! So, just can't imagine that from her. She's so tiny. I know. <laughs> it's just. Hey, that would be for big fat people like me. Me. And I've had it. Mm. Had double bypass and valve replacement a year and a half ago. Go ahead and say a quick prayer, uh, lifting these names up to God's throne, and then we will begin our Bible class lesson. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and uh, first off, we want to express uh, our gratitude. Uh, truly, uh, no amount of words or whatever that we can say uh, can truly just uh, um, express uh, the gratitude that we have. Uh, just words are not enough uh, to just offer and to send up before your throne, uh, but we do want to express our thanksgiving for uh, allowing us to wake up uh, with peace on our mind, with heaven on our mind, with souls on our mind, with uh, your kingdom on our mind, uh, being able to receive all the many rich and powerful blessings that you bestow upon us, blessings that are in disguise, and even blessings at times that are unexpected and uh, that we don't deserve. Uh, but it truly shows just how awesome and gracious uh, of a God that you are, uh, the God of our ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Uh, we thank you so much for being our God and our Father, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort others and theirs. And at this time, Father, we know that uh, you are with us and you are present with us and you heard our uh, requests, but we want to lift them up uh, before your throne by name uh, because these individuals are in desperate need of comfort right now. We ask that you be with Mary Fred Johnston with her heart surgery that's coming up. We ask that you be with Ricky Treats, who recently had gone through a stroke. Place your healing hand upon them. Uh, be with them as they are struggling financially. Uh, may we as a church or, and as uh, congregations around be able to uh, put together a special collection to uh, perhaps maybe to help take the load off. Uh, and again, it's showing acts of kindness and acts of mercy, um, even when at times people don't deserve them. Uh, but we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I think this is a good example of us wanting to help out, uh, to show love toward our neighbor, to put <coughs> his need and his interest above our own. We ask that you also be with uh, the Sexton family with the passing of Micah. I know that, well, I can't say that I know, but I just cannot even imagine the pain of, you know, just losing a, your own child, uh, a child that you have raised and a child that you have disciplined and nurtured and to just lose them one day, uh, I just really can't, I can't even imagine the pain. But Father, you know the pain because you offered your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And so we ask that you be with the Sexton family, give them the comfort that they need. Our prayers and our presence and our love is always with them. We thank you so much for this time that we have right now to just set aside all the worldly concerns and the things that are on our mind and to be able to give our undivided attention to the teaching of your word through the book of James. We thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. May we be attentive, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger with our study through the book of James. It's our prayer to your son's name, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right, well, let's give a little bit of a review on what we have discussed and studied so far. What has been going on at the beginning of chapter 2? Well, actually, hold on, let me simplify it um, for you. James had discussed about having a pure 
an undefiled religion before the Father, which would be your worship, your service, your spiritual life, your Christianity, your personal walk with God. If you want it to be undefiled and pure, it is to visit the widows and the orphans and to keep oneself unstained, unspotted from the world. And so, he then gives, following that, he then gives, or is going to give, a list of worldly stains that have crept in at the Church of Christ at Jerusalem. And so far, from the beginning of chapter 2, he discusses that first stain. What stain was that? Showing favoritism for the rich, disdain for the poor. That's right, showing favor to the rich, disdain or disfavor to the poor. And so, that is a stain that has crept in. And, last Wednesday, we began at verse 8 and following to 13, in which James will discuss on what it is that they need to do in order to remove that stain of partiality that has crept in. And he mentions, beginning at verse 8, of an excuse that they were making. So he confronted them in this letter about... Okay, you're showing favor to the rich. Now, what's your explanation for that? Verse 8, what was their supposed explanation? Somebody read verse 8 of James chapter 2. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Did you read chapter 2, verse 8? James. James. Oh. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that was a good passage. That was the right one. <laughs> it applies to though. Okay. <laughs> Two verse eight. Five. Oh, yep. there it is. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. Alright, he says if. 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 And in the Greek that is the First class conditional statement. In other words, he's using it as a hypothetical approach. So if you are really, your excuse is that you're just loving your neighbor as yourself. Well, if you are really doing that. You can't show respect one above one above another. One above another, absolutely. So their excuse is, hey, we're just fulfilling the law of love your neighbor as yourself. Well, James says, oh, really? Well, if you were really doing that, then you would have done it to the poor man as well. But you didn't. And so the same command that you are trying to justify yourself with is the same is the command that is also condemning you for showing discrimination to the poor. He then goes on to say that, well, you failed in that, therefore you failed the entire law. Because if you're one point guilty, you're guilty of what? All. Of it all. And last week, as I was driving home after a Wednesday night, there's another good example that I could have given that uh, it just came to me. But there's 619 laws of the Old Testament, give or take. Think of it as like a puzzle. You have 619 pieces. If you were to miss or lose, one of those pieces, is it a complete puzzle? No, it's not. Now, we as human beings may try to justify ourselves and try to say, oh, well, I mean, it's just this little corner piece. I mean, it'll be okay. I still think it's full and complete. Well, you cut yourself and try to justify yourself all you want, but the fact of the matter is, is that because you lost that one piece, even though you have 618 pieces of that puzzle, it is still an incomplete puzzle. That is sort of where we left off at in verse 10. And so as we continue and pick up at verse 11, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So, not only 
Were they uh, one point guilty of following the law and then has become guilty of it all, but they were also <laughs> cherry-picking which commands they wanted to follow and which commands they were not wanting to follow. Not only that, but even the applying, the application of the command. See, here they were applying, love your neighbor as yourself to the rich man, but they were not applying it to the poor man. So they became judges, as he mentioned earlier. Who are you? Who died and made you ruler? Who died and made you master? Who died and made you judge in determining who gets to have love and respect and who does not? Who are you to get to determine what is right and what is wrong, which commandments you want to follow and which commandments are not important? Who are you? Who died and made you judge? Did you die for everyone's sins? And did you raise from the tomb? No, you did not. But Jesus did, chapter 2, verse 1. Which is why he's our Lord, Master, ruler of our life. We follow what he has to say. He is the judge overall. He is the law giver. It is his choice on what it is that he wants us to do. The royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, you fulfill of it all. If you love your neighbor, then you will honor your father and mother. If you love your neighbor, you would not commit adultery with his wife or her husband. If you love your neighbor, you would not steal from them. If you love your neighbor, you will not covet any of their possessions. And the list goes on. Verse 11. He says, You have heard that he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. If we want to justify our actions based on law, then we would have to keep the whole law. Imagine yourself standing before a judge of court for murder. The judge asks you the question saying, what is your plea? Well, your response is that, Judge, I have not committed um, adultery. Yeah, I murdered, but guess what? I did not commit adultery. What will the judge say? So? So? <laughs> what does that, what does that have to do with murder? Yes, what does that have to do with murder? So this is the absurdity of their argument. The Christians were picking and choosing their set of laws, commandments, and applications that they want to be responsible for. Even more, they are picking and choosing their sins. That is, thinking of which sins are big sins, which sins are the bigger sins, and which sins are the biggest sins. Well, in God's eyes, sin is sin. Yes, even though that. Each sin may have a greater punishment as far as the consequences go. If you commit adultery and if somebody else murders, it's still sin in God's eyes. It's still sin in God's eyes. There's no sin that's greater than the other. So that somehow makes it okay to show partiality? Yeah, you did not commit adultery, you did not commit a murder, but you're showing partiality. Guess what? It's still sin. And you can't make the excuse saying that, well, it's not as bad as murder or adultery. James says it doesn't care. It's still sin in God's eyes. You are just picking and choosing what you do want to follow and what you do not want to follow. James wants them to know that sin is sin and that committing of any sin makes you fall out of line. That is a law breaker. This is one reason why we have so many denominations in the world. Because they want to cherry-pick the commands that they want to follow and throw away the rest of God's commandments. Even more, this is one reason why so many congregations in our brotherhood have fallen away. This is why so many congregations in our brotherhood, in which their lampstand has been removed by Christ. Why? Because they have been cherry-picking which commands they want to follow and which commands they don't want to follow. But if a person who does cherry-pick the commands of God, 
Does that change God's law? Does that change the truth? Sure. No. Because truth is always objective. It's absolute. It stays the same today, tomorrow, and forever. So no matter what you try to cherry pick, no matter what you try to twist, no matter what you try to use to justify yourself, it doesn't change the truth of God's word. So when we appeal to law, we need to be careful, James says. He goes on to say in verse 12, So speak, and so act, as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. What illustration did James give earlier about speaking and acting? Yeah, James gave an example of speaking and acting. Go back to chapter 1, verse 26. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, oh, no. <laughs> we don't like that. Yeah, we don't like that one very <laughs> Well, for the handouts that I've given you, that phrase that says right there, so speak and so act, underline it, and then right above it, put one colon 26. The man who thinks he is religious and does not, what does it say? Does not what? Bridle his tongue. Bridle his tongue. Always say brittle. I don't know why. Well, maybe I'm thinking of peanut brittle. <laughs> peanut brittle is probably on my mind. <laughs> mm. the, way you control, the way you control a horse is mm -hmm. with the bridle right. in his mouth, and that then he goes where he's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's harder to bridle our tongue. Yes, it is. And in the context, what is this man who thinks he's religious, what is he having the trouble with as far as his tongue? Why is he lashing out? Or what is he lashing out against? Well, he's deceiving his own heart. Mm -hmm. If it says his religion's in vain, so mm -hmm. if he can't control his tongue... Go back to verse 19, read verse 19. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Slow to speak. Slow to speak in regards to what? What are we doing right now? We're studying. Studying God's word. Remember? You've got to be quick to hear God's word. Slow to speak in regards to God's word. Slow to anger. This man who thinks he's religious has a hard time with being slow to speak. Why? Because he's hearing something from the word of truth that he does not like. And so he says, well, I know the Bible says this, I know God's word of truth says this, but this is what I think is right in regards to what religion is. Is that a still, isn't that a big problem today still? Yes, it is. And again, these are Christians, Christians in the first century that James is writing to. And so, yes, I mean, I always tell people, before you even try to apply it to denominations, make sure that you apply it to yourself first, because that is who James is writing to, New Testament Christians, not denominations, to New Testament Christians. And yeah, there are many, a brother and a sister in the, uh, within our brotherhood that have a hard time when it comes to the preaching and teaching of God's Word. They hear something that they don't like. Why? Because it's exposing their sin, it's exposing their weakness, and therefore they lash out. They start saying that, well, yeah, God says that, but that's, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I know what God says about this topic or this topic, but this is what makes me feel better. 
And so in his mind, he thinks he is religious. But in the eyes of God, he's not. And so this is what the brothers were doing. They were no better than that man who thinks he is religion, or religious. Because what is it that they are not acting on? Going back to chapter 2, verse 12. He says, so speak and so act. What is it that they are not doing in the context? Well, they're not loving their neighbor. They're not loving their neighbor, specifically the poor man. They're not treating the rich man and the poor man as equals. So James says, speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. We are to speak and act as to understand with wisdom from above that we are to be judged by the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? Christ's law. Christ's law. Go back to chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 25. <clears throat> but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The way we conduct our lives in this realm, as Christians striving to accomplish the will of God, should indicate the reality that we are to be that we are one day to be judged. And on that day, Christians will be measured by the law of liberty. Right next to that, go ahead and reference John chapter 12, verse 48. There, Christ says that we will be judged by his word. Say that again. John chapter 12, verse 48. And we will be judged by his word. And so, yes, we are so to speak and so to act as those who are being, uh, who are to be judged by the law of liberty. And again, the law of liberty is the word of truth, chapter 1, verse 25. So again, the part of wisdom from above is understanding who is in charge, that is God. The man who thinks he is religious is one who's in charge of his own religion, but he is going to be judge, or he's going, uh, but is he going to judge himself in the end? The man who thinks he is uh, religious, the one who is in charge of his own religion, is he going to judge himself in the end? No. No. Who is he going to be judged by? By Christ. By Christ. By the perfect law of liberty. Christ's law, the word of truth. God is the one in charge, and the one who will judge us with his perfect law of liberty. So why does James refer to it as the law of liberty? What does liberty mean? Freedom. We have freedom. Freedom. Freedom to choose. Freedom to choose. <clears throat> it is the standard that gives freedom rather than enslavement. Freedom from what, specifically? What does Christ free us from? He frees us from sin. Frees us from sin. No longer being enslaved to it. Romans chapter 6, verse 20 through 22. Christ is the only one who can make that happen for us. Under Christ, we are free. Under the law of liberty, we find freedom. In which testament is Christ under? The New Testament. The New Testament. The New the Testament. New law. What's that? The new law. The new law. <clears throat> So, I mean, it's not rocket science. Y'all are seeing the connection here. Y'all are doing a great job in answering it. Christ is the only one who can make that happen for us. So under him, we are free. And under the law of liberty, his law of liberty, we find freedom. So therefore, the law of liberty comes from Christ. It is the law of Christ. And other inspired writers refer to it as being the law of Christ. I encourage you to write down 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21, and Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. So remember, 
Christ is the one who is in charge. Remember what James said back at verse 1 of chapter 2. <clears throat> My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Wisdom from above begins at that point. We are not in charge. We cannot cherry pick his commandments. Now, interestingly, this word judged, I'm going to use my laser pointer. Oh, you can barely see it. <laughs> but this word judged not only expresses a, uh, a future event that's to come, it includes that, which is on Judgment Day, we're going to be judged by his standard, the word of truth, the law of Christ. But what's interesting is that this word is also present tense in the Greek. So what does that mean? If it's present tense, what is James saying? We're judged now by the people who see what we do and say. And what's by what measure? What's again? What's judging us? <coughs> the law of liberty. The law of liberty. Yes. So yes, people are going to see if our life our worship, our service, our pure and undefiled religion, if it measures up to the standard, to the perfect law of liberty, the law of Christ, the word of truth. So we are being, who are being judged. Our speech and action should continually reflect that we are being judged and watched by God. We are to speak and act like those who have truly been liberated and who are being judged by the standard of freedom, the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, the word of truth. He then says, For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, we need to understand what this word mercy means. The word literally <coughs> means, when we think of mercy, we tend to almost automatically think of forgiveness. I'm going to forgive you and be merciful towards you. Or I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to go easy on you and show mercy. That's sort of almost like a way that we, how we think of it, but it's more to it than just that. Forgiveness is involved in mercy, but it's something so much more. The word itself means to give something to someone that they cannot give themselves. Give something to someone that they cannot give themselves. And when you look at the context of James chapter 2, again, give something to someone that they cannot give for themselves. In the context, can I have somebody read verse 15 of chapter 2? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? You do not give them the things that are what? Needed. Needed. For what? The body. Right there is an example of an opportunity of showing mercy to someone, giving something that they cannot give for themselves. This is a brother or a sister who's in desperate need of food and clothing, the necessities of life. Right now they're at a low point in their life. I mean, they're trying, but they're bearing no fruit. They can't get good clothing. They can't get food in their bellies. So James says, you have an opportunity to show mercy. But the person's faith who has no works, the person's faith that is actually dead, yeah, they say it, but they don't do it. They say, yeah, you need these things, but I hope and pray that You'll find it. Have a nice day. James is like, really? And we'll talk more about that here in just a few moments. 
But again, the word means to give something to someone that they cannot give for themselves. It is like giving either food or clothes to someone when they cannot obtain it for themselves. That is one practical way of applying Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, James is the practical commentary of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I call that the boomerang effect. <laughs> Just like when you throw a boomerang, what happens? It comes right back at you. When you are merciful in return, mercy will be given to you. And like he <coughs> told the, the person that uh, in verse 13, the person that um, thought he was doing but he didn't control his tongue, but he thought he was okay. It said, for he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. And if he didn't show mercy, you're not going to get mercy. So we have the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And so these brethren, they were not showing mercy to the poor man. And James, later in the next two verses, is going to give an example of a brother or sister who's in need, and you're not going to show them mercy. And because you're not showing them mercy, because you're not acting and doing, you're just saying. Faith without works is dead. You have a dead faith. It's not alive. It's not active. It's not fruitful. <laughs> it's dead. Unfortunately, though, the Christians that James is writing to have been merciless. How have these Christians not shown mercy? Well, again, we just stated, first, number one, favoritism has caused them not to treat the man as how he needs to be treated. Second, they did not help either of them spiritually. Notice that. Both the rich man and the poor man came into the assembly seeking something spiritual. We don't know their spiritual condition. But all we know is that they both came into the assembly. So what would that mean? Well, people don't come in here just, just to come in here. <laughs> they come in here because they're seeking something. They're in need of something. And James says that you pampered this rich man physically, but you didn't even help him spiritually. You didn't show the same poor man the kind of respect and love that you show the rich man. And you did not even help the poor man spiritually either. James is like, what's going on here? You did not even help both of them spiritually. Remember how we said last week that both the rich man and the poor man came into the assembly seeking something spiritual. Now, you may think that the rich man already had everything that he needed, but however, that is not true. When you have wisdom from above, you will see that there are things that even a rich man cannot obtain for himself. What are some things that a rich man cannot obtain for himself? Brotherly love. Forgiveness. Brotherly love. Forgiveness. Salvation. Salvation. Do you not find that a bit interesting? In a way, James is applying that not only are you favoring one person and disfavoring the other, you also gave the rich man something that he could easily give to himself. You gave him the best seat in the house. Well, who cares? He could easily just go down the street and be able to get that for himself. Again, you're focused too much more on the physical, trying to get something out of it as well, physically speaking. You're so caught up in the physical that you've missed what is important. The soul, the spiritual, things that are eternal. Instead of giving him the best seat in the house, which that he could easily get for himself down the street, give him something that he needs that he cannot give for himself. Salvation, forgiveness, the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a Christian, your job is to give both the rich man and poor man something that they cannot give for themselves, salvation and forgiveness from the gospel. The failure to show mercy strikes at the heart of Christianity. It is about helping people get what they cannot get on their own. 
there is nothing that no one can do to earn it. The poor man cannot earn it because he already has nothing, and the rich man cannot earn it even though he has everything. They both need mercy. The poor man will be more receptive because he has nothing. It will be harder, but possible, for the rich man because he sees himself having no needs. Chapter 1, verse 9 through 11 of James. Judgment is merciless to the one who shows no mercy. And these Christians were not showing mercy. They were defining what is religion on their own terms. They were speaking and acting according to the measure of their own behavior and what the world thinks. Mercy leaves the children with confidence to face judgment. Oops. But the... Yeah, you hit a button and flip it back. That was interesting. <laughs> oh, that's why I was looking. Okay. Whoopsies. Perhaps Still I need catching to... up. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Let me just turn it off right there real quick. Okay, so all of us stand in need of mercy from God because none of us have lived perfectly. We've all failed. We've all made mistakes. And we're always in need of God's mercy. Am I right? If, you, if we are truly Christians and have truly repented of a mistake that we've made, confessed our faults to one another, confessed our shortcoming to Jesus in prayer, and genuinely repented of it, has not God forgiven us? Yes, he has. How many times has God forgiven us and extended his mercy toward us? Every time we ask for it. Every time we ask for it. Oh, shoot. I thought you wanted an actual number. <laughs> <laughs> I can't count that high. Please, can't you count that high? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, possibly even if we try to count. I mean, we'd lose count, would we not? We easily lose count. I mean, it's, it's almost like innumerable. It's almost... His mercy that he has extended towards you and I has just been almost unlimited. Well, since we sincerely repented, then why is it why is it that we are so good at keeping the guilt? I think Satan helps us do that. Mm -hmm. I just didn't hear what you said. Sorry. <clears throat> when we have truly like repented or confessed our mistake and our fault before Christ and been forgiven for it? Why is it that we're so good at keeping the guilt? Why is it that we still tend to beat ourselves up over it? I think it's just human nature. You, you relive it and you relive it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and as long as you do that, it's right there. Yeah. It is. But even though in Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 through 14 Paul was able to leave it all behind. Sure, I mean, there were reminders that he talked about where he said, like, I'm the chief of sinners and everything. But he never held the guilt against himself. He was able to move forward. But when David prayed for forgiveness, he said, my sin is always before me. Mm -hmm. My sin is always before me. And, of course, we know the incident that happened with him and Bathsheba. But after it was all said and done, the text tells us that David got up and wiped the tears from his eyes and went to bed, got rest, ate food, and moved on. And a lot of his servants were a little bit surprised, confused a little bit. Why is he still not, why does he think that everything's okay? I mean, he just lost his own child, and yet he's still going forward. I mean, like, so, I mean, see, they didn't get it. His servants weren't able to get it. But David was able to do it. He was able to move forward. Paul was able to move forward. Why is it that... They trusted we, that their sins were forgiven, I guess. They trusted that their sins were forgiven. If his sins hadn't been forgiven, God wouldn't have brought Solomon out of that situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. That is absolutely so right. That shows that God had forgiven him. That's right. Absolutely. 
What does the end say right there? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment by providing what we all need spiritually. In the day of judgment, we will all want the victory that mercy gives. Therefore, let us as people, let us live as people to whom mercy has been offered. Let us extend mercy and forgiveness as much as possible. Since God is continually watching, we need to reflect toward others the same mercy and forgiveness that God extends toward us. When you do that, you will not show partiality. You'll be extending mercy to the rich man and to the poor man equally. <clears throat> when you show mercy and extend mercy, you will love the rich man and the poor man equally. So how is it that we get rid and remove <laughs> the stain of partiality? Wisdom from above. Wisdom from above. With wisdom from above, we'll be able to see things the way God sees it. He sees both the poor man and the rich man in desperate need of something that they cannot give themselves. And that is salvation and forgiveness. Extend that. When you extend that equally, then you won't be shown partiality no more. Beautiful thought, huh? Well, I was hoping to at least get right into verse 14. <coughs> and that time, uh, we can save this for next week. We can save it for next week, Lord willing. <laughs> <laughs> we just well, changed the day, don't it? <laughs> is there any other last minute uh, thoughts or comments? This is probably a real good example of showing some mercy and not judging. Absolutely. Yes, it is. I mean, it really is. It really is. That's why when uh, you were explaining what was going on, I was just like, huh. I was like, should I say something? I was like, no, 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 I'll wait till class. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, it is. It's an exact way of being able to extend mercy. Giving something to someone that he or she cannot give for themselves, even when they don't deserve it. You don't mind closing this out in the word prayer, brother? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this time where we come together and to study from your word. And we pray that we may have all gained from these studies and take what we've learned and can go and teach others. We ask that you be with the sick that have been mentioned and those that have lost loved ones. And be with them and give them the strength they need to get through these situations. Continue to be with us and bless us. It would be your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Unfortunately, 